Uh, I'm normally about two octaves higher than this. <laughs> I really sound like a man. It's impressive. <clears throat> so um, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation today, which is maybe a pity because if my voice gives up, you could have read it instead of listening to my terrible voice. Um, but the, the title of my, of my talk is The Happiness of Unrealizable Dreams on the Pursuit of Pleasure in Contemporary Chinese Popular Fiction. Um, and I wanted to start off by pointing out that we've had a lot of questions come up related to happiness um, in the talks this afternoon. Um, questions like, how, how can we be happy? How can we bring about happiness for other people? Um, who should be happy? Who is entitled to happiness? Um, and who can make happiness happen for, for whom? Um, why is it important that we pay attention to happiness, both of ourselves and of other people? Um, why is it important to be happy in the first place? And what does it mean to be happy? And what do we need to have or to, to pursue in order to, uh, for happiness to follow? And I think one theme that came out in a lot of these talks is that um, whether we see happiness as an ideological agenda or some kind of political ploy, whether it's a commercial strategy, an advertising strategy, um, or whether it's a kind of emotional satisfaction that comes through family-based or community-based interactions, Happiness is usually seen as something in the future and something in the conditional tense. So if you do this, or if you surround yourselves with these kinds of people, then happiness will come. <coughs> and so to go back to um, Sarah Ahmed, who a few people have mentioned, happiness is indeed um, a promise or a possibility, as, as Will put it. Um, so it's contingent upon what happens, and it's thus intrinsically risky and difficult to achieve, which is another point that Sarah Ahmed makes in her work. Um, even though everybody seems to agree on this point, that happiness is something that happens, of course, as we've also just heard, many, many people have tried in different ways to provide um, prescriptions. I think Will said, um, script, try to script happiness, to try to create these formulas that say, um, it's not a maybe happiness will happen, but if, yeah, if you do this, then happiness will follow. And this is very much in display in the, the current political slogan in mainland China that's also been mentioned of the China dream, the Zhongguo Meng. Um, the idea that, in fact, the actual phrase associated with the, the China dream is um, So <clears throat> you make the country rich and strong, you make the nation prosperous, and you make the people happy. So happiness is something that follows on in that particular formula from being more rich and more prosperous as a nation. And as individuals, we have to strive for our own, our own personal happiness in order to contribute to the kind of overall happiness of the nation. So my own interest in this paper is less on these kinds of prescriptions for happiness, the if-then kinds of formula, and more on a kind of what-if formula for happiness. So not a happiness that has any possibility of ever coming true, or a happiness that's located somewhere off in the future, but a kind of impossible happiness. Um, or as I put it in, my, in the title of my talk, the happiness of unrealizable dreams. So fictional representations of dreams which probably could never come true in real life because they're based in fantasies, and also have not come true in real life because they're being portrayed through the medium of, of fiction rather than through something more real life. Um, so I'm going to be looking at a, a kind of category of popular fiction that's become really popular, uh, particularly on the internet in mainland China in the last few years, that's described as YY xiaoshuo, YY fiction. And, and YY, I'll say a bit more about this term in a moment, but it's short for yi yin, uh, which is a term that was first used in The Dream of the Red Chamber, Hong Meng, Meng um, that you know, epic 18th century um, novel. Uh, and in that novel, um, yi yin is used to describe the kind of type of lust, which is very much a dream-based lust, demonstrated by the central male character of uh, Jia Baoyu. So uh, this word, yi yin, in the age of the internet has been shortened to yy, the English letters yy. So it's spelt in, in pinyin yiyin, so it's just now become uh, yy. So in, in uh, scholarship on Dream of the Red Chamber, yi yin is translated as lust of the mind. So it's a kind of desire or a lust that exists in the imagination. Sometimes it can spill over into your, your waking kind of real life, 
but much of the time it remains within um, the mind. Uh, so I've decided to translate it uh, as mental porn, <laughs> which I think sounds slightly more um, up-to-date than, than lust of the mind. Uh, and it, again, it gives that sense that it's something mental, um, and it's also something that can be quite explicit as long as it stays within the mind. Um, so I'm going to start with my, with my arguments, and I'm going to end with some questions, which I know is the strange way of doing things. Um, but my, my basic argument in this, in this piece of research is that uh, the ways that people are writing um, and publishing Chinese fiction on the internet can show how um, happy feelings can be produced through this virtual act of fantasizing and intentionally holding the objects of happiness, the things that you, you might want if only they were possible, at the arm's length of fiction. So in this case, it's actually not getting what you want as much as witnessing other people in the stories getting what they want um, that makes you feel good. Um, so you could say, again, using Ahmed's ideas, that fiction allows you to, and this is a quotation, preserve the happiness of the what, as in the object of your desires, as fantasy, and thus avoid the negative outcomes that often follow when your dreams actually do come true, which I think is what perhaps a lot of people who supported Brexit are experiencing right now. <laughs> So um, the novel, I'll just tell you a little bit about briefly this afternoon, that I think is a wonderful example of this kind of imaginative approach to happiness that doesn't really ever expect to come true. Uh, it's a novel called uh, Top Quality House Servant, Ji Pin Jia Ding, and it was published on the uh, fiction website qidian.com between 2007 and 2008. It's very, very long, and I haven't finished reading it, so I'm probably not qualified to analyse it, but I'm going to anyway. <laughs> It's about three and a quarter million Chinese characters long. Um, so it just goes on and on and on and on. Um, and this is very typical of internet fiction. If you feel like there's never going to be an ending, so you're on this kind of constant quest for happiness through the protagonist, but you never quite get there. That's a point I'll come back to. So it's been fairly successful. It's had about 33 million hits online, um, lots of recommendations. It's been published in print um, novels. It's currently being filmed as a TV drama that's going to come out, I think, before the end of the year, so you can watch out for it um, fairly soon. And it, in terms of its genre, it falls within a few different categories of popular fiction. One is time travel fiction, or tran yue xiao fu. Um, one is historical fiction that is built upon air, or jia kong li shi xiao fu, which is essentially fiction set in the historical past, but not a real historical past, a kind of imaginary, made-up, fictionalized historical past. Uh, but it's also a great example of YY fiction with a male protagonist. And the male protagonist part is um, really, really important. Um, and you'll see why in just a moment. So very, very briefly, the, the premise of this novel is you have this modern-day guy, it's very cliché for Chinese internet fiction, this modern-day guy whose name is uh, Lin Wanrong. Um, he's on a business trip to Mount Tai, Tai Shan in Shandong province, where he accidentally falls off the top of the mountain um, and we presume dies. Um, he then wakes up in the middle of the Xuanwu Lake in Nanjing, um, several hundred years back in the past. We don't know exactly what dynasty he's found himself in, um, with nothing to his name. He's just got the clothes upon his back. Nobody knows who he is. Um, but he's from the modern day, so again, it's a very cliched plot in internet fiction. He uses his modern day knowledge to um, create this extraordinarily successful life for himself in pre-modern China. So all of the women around him fall in love with him because he's so handsome and strong and um, he knows so much about classical Chinese poetry and business strategies from 21st century China and so on. Um, he becomes very rich. Um, by the end of the novel, he has become the emperor of China. Um, but he turns down this job opportunity um, because he's a bit lazy and he would rather live in happiness with his many wives that he's accumulated by this stage. And, um, he leaves his son to um, rule the country instead. So um, Lin Wanrong, he starts off this novel not giving a damn about anything around him. He feels pretty down and out, um, pretty despondent. Um, he, he's sitting by the edge of the lake in the opening pages of the novel saying, thinking to himself, oh, this you know, life sucks, basically. There's all these beautiful women and talented men on their boats flirting with each other. Um, you know, what am I going to do with myself? Uh, but then he spits into the lake. Um, and, and he says, this is what the, the novel says, as Lin Wanrong shot a vicious gob of saliva into the lake, his mood started to lift a little and a carefree feeling overcame him. Damn it, it felt good to spit. Lin hadn't felt so overjoyed in a very long time. 
He was pretty sure there weren't going to be any old ladies in red armbands coming over to fine him 50 bucks in this era. <laughs> so th this word that they used to describe feeling good is shuang. Um, and shuang, along with the term yin or wai wai, are two really central concepts for understanding happiness in the imaginative, imaginative world of popular culture and popular fiction in particular. And it comes up again and again in readers' comments on these novels. They say, I enjoy reading it because it made me feel good. So this is not really happiness as the end result of achieving some kind of life goals. It's more this kind of transitory, momentary feeling of both a physical sensation, like spitting into the lake and having that satisfaction of seeing your saliva fly through the air and make ripples in the water, but also the emotional satisfaction of not giving an F, or giving a, a flying um, F about anything. So, and this can create the sense of feeling good, which is not necessarily even an ethical kind of feeling good, um, but it's a very tangible one nonetheless. And you get these guides to writing YY fiction on the, on the Chinese internet, which have titles like 101 Ways to Make Your Readers Feel Good. So feeling shuang is kind of the, the goal, really, of a lot of this kind of writing. Um, and the, this category of YY fiction, again, very, very briefly, um, there's lots of prescriptions for writing YY fiction, even though the kind of happiness can't really be prescribed. And male authored YY fiction um, is apparently defined by the two alls and the three withouts, the liang quan, san wu. Um, so the, the, the two alls, uh, all the women you encounter in a novel as a male protagonist should be virgins, um, both in body and in mind, and you should take them all into your bedroom. So, yeah. Uh, and the three, with, three withouts means that the story should have no thunder or no silly plots, wu lei. It should have no boredom, wu yu men, and it should have no ental entanglements, wu jiu jie. In other words, it's a kind of utopian approach to, to narrative, but again, not utopianism based on creating a better world, just a very kind of selfishly, narcissistically uh, more satisfying world where the individual protagonist can do pretty much anything um, he wants. Um, however, despite this, this strong presence of fantasy, the fantasies within the novels are often frustrated, so they don't come true fast enough, and the length of the novels is already a clue on that, right? If it takes three and a quarter million characters to get to the end, you know that you're not really getting there very fast. Um, and in the case of Lin Wanrong in um, Top Quality House Servant, well, yes, I, I also forgot to mention that he becomes a house servant in a local noble family. That's his first job. He enters this kind of X Factor style competition or Supergirl style competition where he has to sing and dance and impress people and he, and he gets the job. Um, so he then starts flirting with all these women um, and they, of course, all fall in love with him. Um, but he doesn't get a lot of action much of the time. He keeps nearly having sex, but not quite having sex. So I, I thought I'd read you a very... Um, actually, it's not that brief. I'll read you a little section of the novel um, where this happens. Um, and it's in chapter 107 <laughs> of, of 691. Um, so here is uh, Lin Wan Rong with a 17-year-old daughter of the noble family where he's working. He thinks she's too young for him, um, but he soon changes his mind. Um, why don't you like me then? Xiao Yu Shuang felt a lurch of happiness and unable to hold back her feelings any longer, threw her arms around Lin Wanrong. In the midst of her tears, she asked, Is it really because you think I am too young? I will grow up, you know. And mother says that some girls my age are married already. Why don't you like me? Why? <laughs> Xiao Yu Shuang held tightly onto Lin Wanrong's waist and buried her head into his chest, sobbing loudly. Lin Wanrong felt her soft body gently trembling against his chest, Yu Shuang's well-developed breasts pressing against him. This is my favorite bit. Her tender <laughs> jade rabbits rose and fell with her sobs, slowly rubbing against his chest. Is it mental porn, right? Feeling the intense heat of this burning hot female body, Lin Wanrong warned himself repeatedly that the younger Xiao daughter was still a child. He should not be thinking any evil thoughts. But the fire in his lower body betrayed him with its honesty, <laughs> poking lightly into the Xiao sister's smooth belly. You're a beast, a beast, Lin Wanrong reprimanded himself, but Xiao Yu Shuang only held on more tightly, rubbing against his body. So this goes on for a while, and then he says to himself, oh fuck, what the hell am I doing? It can't, excuse my language, it's in the book. Um, it can't go down like this. If we're going to do it, then we should at least go back to my room, conducting field operations on the first go, which surely be a bit too avant-garde. 
so this, is, this is typical of much of these novels. There's this battle between the, the, the kind of mental porn that the character's engaged with and the fact that there are various restrictions in life that prevent those fantasies from coming true, just as the novel is prevented from coming true by the very fact that it is indeed um, a novel. And I think it is these, these deferrals of the moment of satisfaction that in large part creates a sense of momentum when you read this story uh, and keeps you going as a reader. You keep wanting the sense that there, you keep wanting to see the extra possibilities that will come the further you read, whether it's um, sex or money or power or whatever else it might be. So I, I could end with a conclusion, but as I said just now, I want to actually end with a few questions for all of you, uh, which you might like to think about before um, tomorrow, particularly in re with regard to this sense of shuang, of feeling good and how that might relate to happiness. Um, so my first question is, does it matter if the kind of happiness or feeling good that is represented in the world of fiction and achieved through reading novels or playing games or watching TV can only exist in the world of fantasy? Um, so if happiness is primarily a mental state and something that exists actually in the virtual world of the mind anyway, is there any kind of qualitative difference between happiness that comes from real life experiences, um, like coming out to your family, um, and the happiness that comes from vicariously witnessing the achievements of others through uh, the medium of fiction. That's uh, my first question. And my second question is kind of an ethical one. Does it matter if the, the, the premise of feeling good um, is, is on something in unethical or some kind of very selfish behavior? Because actually this novel, pr I, I know I should hate it because I've said this many times when I've talked about this novel to other people. I know I should hate it because I'm a woman. It's terribly sexist. Um, it's terribly heterosexist, um, it, you know, it's chauvinistic, it's, it's awful. Um, and yet there is this sense of satisfaction, of feeling good that comes from watching this guy just saying, well, to hell with, with the rules of society, I've travelled back in time anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Um, so it, does it matter if we gain pleasure from other people's selfishness as a way of feeling good? It doesn't sound like an especially profound question to end on, um, but I shall end on that one nonetheless. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. You may well have questions now. We have uh, we can take uh, five minutes or so to ask the questions. Let's see how that is. Thank you. That was uh, amazing. Uh, what I kind of came to think about was really the contemporary um, long hate relationship to reality. You know, mm -hmm. we watch all this crap television because somehow it makes us feel kind of good or makes us feel, makes us feel better than the people on the TV. I don't know. Maybe you got this response before, but. No. Right. <laughs> but do you see a connection? And I wonder if there, there is perhaps contemporary research or media uh, uh, reception that could actually help answer that question. Mm. Uh, whether that kind of the, the ethics or non-ethics of watching these kind of television shows. Yeah, that's a really good suggestion. Yeah, I should look more into that. I mean, for me, when I watch reality TV, a lot of the time, what's going on in my mind is, thank God I'm not them. <laughs> you know, those people are pretty messed up. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, well, yeah, kind of. It's, it, yeah, it makes you feel smug. I think a lot of the time we watch reality TV to feel smug about, about ourselves. But with these novels, everything's going right, really, for the protagonists. Um, there's, there's frustrations along the way, but, um, but actually they end up incredibly rich and, and powerful and, and with an awful lot of access to the opposite sex. There are some same-sex versions as well, but not, nothing like as many. Um, so I think it's, it's more of wanting to put yourself in their shoes that's the source of feeling good, um, and it being a safe space in which to do so, because it's, it's in the realm of fiction rather than um, the dangerous real world in which we actually live. Yeah, on the question of the possibility of happiness in living and real life, so I wonder in terms of looking at this in terms of happiness as construct uh, emerging partly through seeing the happiness of others. So seeing the happiness in one's parents uh, makes one also partly happy, but one has a bit of happiness as well. So I wonder if you come if, if you come across uh, examples of how readers sharing their uh, feelings about the novel are, are happy <coughs> doing that. So they are oh, yeah. distinguish between the happiness they get from reading it mm. alone, 
yeah. and then happiness from talking about uh, what they've read. Yeah, so, absolutely. I think that's a big part of it. A big part of the enjoyment of serial, serialized or serial culture in general is that we, we consume it <coughs> in installments in, in real life, even though we're you know, enjoying the fictional world. Um, so it's it, it, in very much so. It's reading it with other people and reading the latest chapter as it's published with other readers on the same website and getting to comment on it and feel like you're, you're maybe even helping shape the direction of the narrative as you interact with the reader. Same with um, TV dramas, that you're, you're talking about the latest episode with people just after it's aired um, or, or just after it's up, um, loaded, uploaded online or something. And that community interaction is another level of the kind of enjoyment that comes with this, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think that the, the plan of the conference of Chinese happiness, right, suggesting something, there's something particular about happiness, or Chinese happiness. So I was wondering, actually, in your presentation, I think there are a lot of similarities between this and the author of culture of Japan. So I wondered, have you ever thought, like, are there any particular <coughs> aspects of this enjoyment, the leadership? Are there any differences? Yeah, differences. Mm. Um, well, I think the, there's a lot of similarities. I think Jap Japan's otaku culture is much, much more developed, obviously, um, than mainland China's. I mean, in China right now, there's still a lot of excitement over fan culture being a thing at all. Tongren uh, wenhua or fensi wenhua, the two words that are, are normally used um, in Chinese. Um, in Japan, I think it's otaku culture is so entrenched that, that it's kind of become um, the, the identity of being otaku is much more firmly defined than it is in China. Um, and from what I, I'm not an expert in Japanese popular culture at all, um, but I think there's a lot of prejudice against otakus um, for being um, kind of super fans and being weirdos for being so obsessed with the you know, anime or manga or whatever anime or manga, whatever it might be. Um, yeah. I think it's probably a very big, very big question, difficult one to answer, but there's, there's a lot of kind of cross-pollination happening right now between China and Japan, both in terms of what people are consuming and the kind of language they're using um, to describe the, their identities and the, the behaviours around being a fan and, and consuming something as part of a fan community. That's a really complicated question, mate. Yang the last question for today. <laughs> Not much for you personally, but... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I tried to keep uh, asking questions to keep me awake. Uh, so, um, uh, I think for me, the, the fiction is a mode of subject formation. They try to construct a, a subject of desire. Uh, this, uh, this subject, um, uh, desire for something that they cannot achieve, achieve cannot be able to achieve in reality. Um, or in the social, uh, in the normative social world, but uh, they try to um, identify themselves uh, by reading or consuming the fiction in a way to achieve or fulfill that desire, mm. uh, physical desire, and uh, uh, that, that kind of desire for happiness because in reality it's hard for them to yeah. feel that. Even though you, you, you said they, they become very uh, rich. Uh, um, uh, the uh, character become very yeah. rich and successful. Yeah. Um, uh, I think maybe most people cannot get, become rich and successful in the end. But the, by reading the novel, the 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 kind of constructed kind of fantasy, um, yeah. they uh, succeed in some some ways. Uh, do you think this is the politic of desire? Uh, um, what are these are uh, Rolf trying to argue this? In design in China, um, in the in the era of globalization, people and in China we, um, uh, they have various desire, cosmopolitan desire, and desire for uh, something um, uh, a lot of things. Mm. Uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think it, I think very much these these novels do help construct um, the subjectivity of the of the readers as desiring individuals who want more and more and more. Um, but I think there's also something kind of ambivalent in it, because partly, I think there's something slightly rebellious in immersing yourself in an unreal, fictional world, rather than going out and trying to actually make your dreams come true. And, and you get some online comments um, on the Chinese internet of people making an explicit connection between um, the, the kind of desire built into the China dream discourse and the kind of desire that you see represented in YY discourses. 
Um, and they say, you know, the China dream is a wet dream. Um, it, you know, it, it's, dream, it's talking in your sleep. It's dream talk. It, it's not a real dream for us because we know that actually we're, we're quite disadvantaged. Um, there's so much competition in society that if, whether you can become rich or powerful or beautiful is so contingent upon your, your circumstances at birth and many people will never be able to achieve that. So in immersing themselves so fully in these imaginary worlds, these, these fictional worlds, in some ways I think it's an act of rebellion against the dominant discourse that you will be a desiring individual and you will follow your desires. They're saying, no, we're going to um, engage in mental porn instead. We're going to have lusts of the mind and fantasize in some perhaps quite unethical ways about what we would really like because we know we can't achieve what other people say we should achieve in real life. Yeah. Oh no, that was a negative point to end on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.